In that spirit, we ask that event participants follow our behavior policy at all times during this event. Participants must refrain from intentionally interrupting or disrupting the event. Failure to do so will result in a warning followed by being asked to leave the event or to leave the library for the day. Thank you. First presenter is Lear Keith. Lear has been a radical feminist for only 40 years. <laughs> She's the founder of Wolf Women's Liberation Front and the author of seven books. She will be speaking on the origins of quote unquote gender ideology and what we can do to stop it. Please welcome Lear. So this record came out in 1972, which was also the year that my mother went to consciousness raising. Uh, true story. Uh, the glorious results are before you today. Um, we had this record, and I still remember the words. And I remember going around the schoolyard and asking the girls, one by one, are you for women's lib? That's what I said, <laughs> women's lib. I was seven years old, but I wanted to know who had my back, who was going to dig down and find some courage and fight for women. I'm 57 now. I've lost every battle I've fought, but I'm still asking, are you for women's live? Yeah. For asking that question, for asserting that women are a material class. I've had so many death threats that men with guns have been assigned to my protection detail. If you had told me 20 years ago that one day feminists would need armed protection in order to speak, I would not have believed you. And it's not the government that wants me dead, it's not the pornographers and the pimps, and not right-wing ideologues. It's entirely men on the left, specifically men who call themselves transgender. Now, how did we get here? So, 6,000 years ago, don't worry, we're going to go fast. Uh, patriarchy begins. Now, patriarchy is a pyramid, and some people are on top. They extract resources, including labor, from people below them. They have a whole range of social structures to help in that extraction and an ideology that affirms their right to do it. So there's the material extraction and then the support ideology. Now around the globe, women face constant insults to our intelligence, our bodies, our lives. One example, the number one reason women go to hospital emergency rooms is battering. That's a man beating up a woman. In the United States alone, a man does that every nine seconds. That is more hatred than I can comprehend. This is the basic insight of feminism. Women share a common condition. And that condition is political. It's not bad luck. It's not choosing the wrong man. It's not created by evolution. And it wasn't ordained by God. None of these horrors are inevitable. 
which means our biology is not the problem. According to the UN, sex is the biological and physiological characteristics that define men and women. So sex is simply a fact. Gender, on the other hand, is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities considered appropriate for men and women. That's the problem. Gender is the extraction and the ego. So for male dominance to continue, every generation of boys has to be molded into dominators. Being a quote, real man requires a psychology of entitlement emotional numbness, and a dichotomy of self and other. Now, central to masculinity is a violation of imperative. Men become, quote, real men by breaking boundaries. For the entitled psyche, the only reason no exists is because it's a sexual thrill to pulse faster. The real brilliance of patriarchy is right here. It doesn't just naturalize oppression, it sexualizes acts of oppression. It eroticizes domination and submission, and then institutionalizes them as masculinity and femininity. So it naturalizes, it eroticizes, and then it institutionalizes domination and submission. And that's brilliant. The brilliance of feminism is that we figured that out. Female socialization is a process of psychologically constraining and breaking girls, otherwise known as women to create a class of compliant victims. Now, across history, this breaking has included so-called weak practices, like foot binding, like female genital mutilation, as well as the ever popular child sexual abuse. Femininity is just a traumatized psyche displaying acquiescence. Gender demarcates <coughs> the geopolitical boundaries of patriarchy. of women's lives are unspeakable. Each woman cut adrift in a hostile, chaotic sea. Apply the words sex class, and that chaos snaps into a sharp pattern of subordination, from the small daily insults to body and soul, to the shattering traumas of incest and rape. The crimes men commit against women are done because women belong to a subordinate class, and they're done to keep women a subordinate class. It's not personal and it's not random. It's political and it's unjust. <laughs> to get justice for women, we have to dismantle the caste system called gender. Brick by brick, we have to bring it down. We mm. accommodate to it, not make the best decision we can inside it but bring it down. Woo! Bring it down! And now we come to the new sport in that system, transgenderism. Reading the words of girls who think they are transgender <laughs> has broken my heart. Now in their own words, this is what makes them transgender. Mm -hmm. I like skateboarding, I love math, I want short hair, I hate my body. They want physical freedom a life of intellectual pursuits and bodily integrity. They want to be human beings, not objects. Now, feminism is very simple. It says all women are human beings, not objects. That's right. Yep. Feminism is also very hard because in the words of Andrew Dworkin, it requires precisely what patriarchy destroys in women, unimpeachable bravery and confronting their power. Now, transgenderism is also very simple. It claims some people like being objects, and most people are called women. Other people don't like being objects, and they're called men. This is innate, immutable, created by God, or evolution, or hormones, or something, because clearly women's little brains can't handle the rigors of skateboarding or math. <laughs> Instead, we are compelled by God, or evolution, or hormones, to be pink, precious princesses. And when we age out of that, the phenomenon is awakened. Mm -hmm. 12 million searches for teen porn. 14-year-old girl, my stupid. 
the only world they see is the cage made by men and their conditions. Mm -hmm. The only feminism they see is a celebration of collusion, not any kind of resistance. The personal isn't political now. The personal is personal. And some girls hate their bodies because they are their boys. This is the way out. Refuse to see yourself in other girls. Deny the cast you all have it and the system that puts you there. You are a human being. The other girls aren't. And you lose a sisterhood and you rumor a female solidarity. Any last whisper that once there were women who were warriors is gone. In my teen years, we punished our bodies with eating disorders and self harm. And yeah, those spread by wild social contagion. Those practices have now been medicalized and institutionalized. Your doctor will take care of that hard line if you want that. You can have injections, and your surgeon will be protected for you. And many of the girls who are shunted down the path would grow up to be lesbians. Young lesbians are being gutted of their uteruses, their ovaries destroyed, their breasts sliced away, and their vaginas atrophied. All before they can vote. Free to be a human being with chemicals and surgery. Mm -hmm. They should be our next generation of warriors. And instead, the battlefield is their female flesh. Exactly. The loss is not just individual. Lesbians are always the beating heart for women's liberation. And every so often, lesbianism and feminism come together for a brief moment when there's an explosion across the culture. Women make progress and women love women. It really is just that simple. Woo! Tell you there's one woman being choked, one woman having her head yanked back by her hair, a woman crying in pain on an endless page of women being objectified, hurt, and sold for money. Mm -hmm. And there's 13 million search hits for this. Men are now saturated in the sexuality of pornography, in sex that is about power, about love, about cruelty, about permission, about violation instead of permission. And some of them are going to find that subordinate role. Mm -hmm. The porn industry is churning these guys out like puzzles. Well, this is what men are doing to themselves with porn. This is what they think a woman is. In real life, these are the images that women are drowned in. A relentless display of women used to body parts, turned into objects, willingly abused and more than men. This is the landscape of the mass media on this male healthy. This is what women are fighting against to a certain man. How many of these photos do we have to see before the ad is here? That's what a woman is. That's what a woman is for. Oh, yeah. So here's the bargain basement version. <laughs> bargain basement version. <laughs> you can never tell. You can never tell. There's so many versions of this, just millions of photos. I love to eat zombies. Yeah, they do. Um, does it get any clearer when you see grown ass men dressed as sexy schoolgirls? Yeah. Ballerinas? You've probably been trying to say, oh, we're going to be zombies. And if you don't think that that has real world consequences, talk to me about David Challoner during the campaign. So, and this is what is waiting for these guys an entire genre called sissification or forced feminization porn. I don't have the heart to, sh to show you what this looks like, but it's men taking on aspects of femininity as humiliation and pain for the purpose of sexual arousal. So cross-dressing, getting called a woman's name, being anally penetrated with giant dildos, or like literally a man's whole arm, oh. wearing fake breasts or high heels, or being led around by a chain in public. It is horrible watching human beings get personal naked. But until you enter this world a tiny bit, you will never understand the nature of this movement. This is where they are coming from. This is the hell mob. Some of them will even admit it in public. This is where our future is. This is Mr. Andrea Longshore. Used to know him. His book, Females, A Concern, was reviewed in the London and the New York Times. So here's a quote. 
Femaleness is a universal sex defined by self negation. I'll define as female any psychic operation in which the self is sacrificed to make room for the desires of another. The barest essentials of femaleness are an open mouth, an expectant asshole, blank, blank eyes. Now that's what they think these men think that a woman is. Mm -hmm. And they want women, they want to be women because subordination gives them a hard on. I'm sorry that's to be right. so crude, but that is the driving force behind this movement. That's right. Yeah, they've got a few billionaires, but that's what powers it. Not what billionaires powers. like it too. The driver is the paraphernalia. The name for this is autogynophilia. This term was coined by Dr. Lee Venture. These men are sexually aroused by the thought of themselves as women. Now, it is now considered the worst kind of transphobia to mention autogynophilia when we say it. Meanwhile, many of them freely admit it. I'm just going to slide it on the why. <laughs> Mr. Andrea Longchu again saying uh, autogynophilia describes not an obscure paraphilic affliction but rather the basic structure of all human sexuality. This is not just because everyone has an erotic image of themselves as female, they do, but the assimilation of any erotic image is by nature female. So he, his claim is that he's a woman, but the way he gets in is by insisting that, hey, everyone's a woman. But the reason he wants to be a woman is because a woman is the thing on which acts are done, and that I believe is not well. This is wild, and no other oppressed group in the history of the planet would be expected to put up with it. And if you think Mr. Andre is a one off, this was in the New York Times a few months ago. So, because some men find the word woman offensive, the New York Times has decided that. Individuals who have receptive vaginal sex is a reasonable replacement for the word woman. No. When no. our passive sexual receptacles are an active male agent, this matches rather precisely how Mr. Andrea defies woman, and it is, of course, the entire endless point of pornography. Or as Dr. McKinnon said so succinctly, man plus woman, subject, verb, object. Yep. And you're allowed to get angry at this. You don't have to keep that's right. Don't. Well, don't worry, we won't. One reason we are losing this war is because women refuse to face the nature of these men. Oh, the poor dear suffer from gender dysphoria. No, they don't. Their suffering is entirely self-inflicted. They are obsessed with their subordination fetish to the point that it takes over their personalities and their lives, and they don't care who they destroy in the process. You can ask the women and children who have survived these men. Their stories are horribly the same used by narcissistic, abusive men who demand full servicing of their sexual desires. Okay, we say biology is real, and that humans are a sexually dimorphic species. This doesn't seem controversial, but the genderists have made it so. They insist that biology is a social construct because suddenly, after two billion years, sex is a spectrum and something about seahorses. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the clownfish. Get the clownfish. Gender is women's oppression, and we've got centuries of mutilated feet, genitals, and rib cages to back us up. That's right. They say no, gender is great fun. The only problem is that you don't get to choose between the dominant and the subordinate ones. That's right. Some want men really want the sophisticated, and they are enraged when they are denied. The name for that is the Greek title. Take that home, you can read it. Our solution is to dismantle male supremacy. Their solution runs into trouble. They know that biology is not a story that humans made up. They can't dismantle it. So the best they can do is stop anyone from talking about it. Mm -hmm. Our best outcome would be women's liberation. Their best outcome? Well, women are losing the ability to talk about sex-based depression since sex doesn't exist. The women on the front lines are, as ever, the least of us. This is what's happening to women. Women in homeless shelters, in prisons, in battered women's shelters are being forced to share intimate spaces with men who claim to be women. The dignity and safety of the most vulnerable women have been weighed against the feelings 
of outbound sexual predators. And the feelings of those men have been declared more important. Feminists warn what is for and that they are I want everyone to imagine the terror of being lost in an eight by ten cell with a serial sex killer. Yep. This is happening to women. Yep. And in the California prison where this is happening, women are sleeping in shifts because none of them are safe to shut their eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is happening to women. A woman in the UK was in the hospital in what was supposed to be a woman only ward, only there was a man there, and he raped her. Now that's horrible enough, but what happened next defies description for an entire year. Both the hospital and the police refused. Refused to do anything except repeat that no men were there, so there was no rape. An entire year. The only reason she was able to Crowbar some justice out of anyone was because there was CCTV video all over the hospital and there was footage of her rape. This is what happens when you insist on absurdities like trans women are women. They're not. They're men. Um, and they were discussing single sex wars and it's just before it, and Baroness Nicholson said, during that year, she has almost come to the edge of her spirit now. Because being disbelieved about being raped in a hospital has been such an appalling shock. A hospital with all its CCTV has had to admit that the rape happened and that it was committed by a man. Um, this is hospital policy. Men are allowed to pray with such women and get a bed on the female ward. And if any of the sick, vulnerable women ask about this presence on a female ward, the staff have been instructed to lie to women and say, There is no man here. Even if he rapes you, they will keep telling you, There is no man. Obi Kanti said, Mr. Cummings, they said, what does it cost you, he said, and now here we are. So, ultimately, the gender is trying to liberate men's sexual fetishes. This is a men's sexual rights movement, and for that, we need women's coordination. Now, we expect that a first marriage to marry. We weren't prepared for it, and we left. Women have lost their jobs, they've lost careers, they've lost publishers, They've lost custody of their kids, and they've been physically assaulted. The most basic facts of biology are now considered free speech, which means the reality of women's lives is back to being most people. The worst part is no one believes us. I'm not budging from this. No one's holding the line for me. Your body is yours, and a miracle. His patriarchy is you, not me. The red wing red patriarchy says, your personality doesn't match your body, change your personality. The left wing brand offers to change your body to match your personality. And by change, what they mean is chemicals and surgeries that will destroy your fertility, your sex organs, your bones, your liver, your heart, and your lifespan. I have no word for this success citizen. Meanwhile, feminists are still here, still arguing for the inviolable integrity of every human body. Your right to inhabit yours no matter who you are. There is nothing wrong with you. The situation as it stands, civic institutions that were built as a bulwark against power are crumbling. The ACLU has actively tried to keep citizens from accessing the freedom of information at the US. The American Booksellers Association has declared a feminist book hate speech. Journalists are afraid of losing their jobs. If all of this doesn't chill you, nothing will. At Harvard, a professor is in trouble for saying pregnant women. Academia is all. Go Hogwarts, still stands. <laughs> people I found as friends and comrades just want to keep their heads down so they can keep their jobs, hoping that the fever will break because this can't go on. Well, it can. Mm -hmm. Now I'm asking the same question I did as a child. Are you for women's liberation? I still want to know who has my back. I want to know who's going to apply that unimpeachable bravery and confront male power. And if we can't do it for ourselves, we have to do it for her. Because there is no one else to do it. So one more time. Are you for women's liberation? <laughs>
a local celebrity. She's a singer, songwriter, and radical feminist living and working in Madison, Wisconsin. This was a founding member of Women's Liberation Radio, WLRN, a grassroots media collective that produces a monthly women's news analysis and music show. She will be telling her personal story of the years of harassment and bullying she has endured from gender identity activists. <laughs> Northern California after a long bicycle music tour down the West Coast. I practice ecstatic dance once a week for nine months in a lovely community center near Garberville on Sundays at an event we fondly refer to as Dance Church. I founded a weekly ecstatic dance practice here in Madison after I got back from my bicycle adventures in 2007. It was mostly women who came and participated, though we didn't have a rule that it be women only. Um, and it was once a week on Sundays at Main Street Yoga right here in Madison. And I did this for five years. Through the years, there were a few men who were asked to leave because they made women feel uncomfortable by leering at them or even sometimes making lewd gestures and touching inappropriately. Not all of the men who joined us did this, but the few who did were asked to leave, except for one. <laughs> um, there was a man who joined and asked to be referred to as she. Um, which I thought nothing of at the time. This was like 2012, 2013. And I was fine with him being on the dance floor with us. He would wear mini skirts sometimes, but mostly he kept to himself and I did not feel uncomfortable until one Sunday, I looked up and I saw him touching himself and licking his lips during the dance. I told another woman leader in a private meeting what I had seen and I referred to him as he when I did this. And she corrected me and reminded me that he wanted to be referred to as she, and also that she thought that I was big enough to just tolerate him and that we didn't need to take any action. And so after that, I didn't feel comfortable anymore going to dance church. The year was 2013 and I was just waking up to what this whole transgender craze is. And I knew that I couldn't stay with this male dancer being allowed to behave how he did and me being required to call him she. So. That's just one story of many that have occurred here in this mad city. I'm sure there are other women in the audience today who have had a similar experience at work, school, or at some event here in Madison. Thank you all for coming to support me in particular, but to support the cause of women's freedom of expression and ability to be in public without harassment. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Harassment, threats of violence online, ostracizing, hounding, stalking, and launching campaigns against an individual's place or places of employment and their reputation. Just to be clear, I do not think that disagreement constitutes harassment and any of and any of any kind, but rather one's right to disagree and publicly defend one's arguments is fundamental to democracy. What follows are stories of me getting harassed and forced out of Madison's establishment, leftist organizations, publications, and groups due to never backing down on my position that there is no such thing as a special kind of man who is actually a woman. they may have altered their appearance with expensive cosmetic surgeries and hormones to appear female or gone to St. Vinny's and done the, uh, what was it, the basement variety of a, an outfit. I find this trend to be incredibly disrespectful to women, as if we are some sort of costume a man can put on, and I refer to, the pra I refer to this uh, practice as woman face to emphasize the disrespect of women I find inherent in the practice of pretending. And I mean all of the people around the man too, not just the man. All of us pretending that um, this special man is female. Um, that, and, um, okay. In a recent hit piece in Tone Madison, a local online publication, the author Emily Mills, calls me a martyr for the cause, which got me to thinking about how I never intended to be anyone's martyr. <laughs> I'm a thistle growing up through the cracks of the sidewalk. Woo! Woo! An eco-primitive radical, yeah. not a martyr. 
I remember in 2011, I was on a talk radio show with my band, Thistle and Thorns, right before we went on tour, and the host called my lifestyle of riding bikes long distances, camping along the way, and playing shows a sacrifice. And I remember responding, as did members of my band who were involved in the mobile villages of bike riders I co-created back then, that it's not a sacrifice to rely on yourself and your intentional community in nature to figure things out. Right, Tiffany? <laughs> um, so, uh, 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 ooh, lost my place, sorry. Figure things out. You got it. Thank you. Um, for me, my lifestyle, for me, my lifestyle will always be Lily, low impact luxury living. That's the term we use to describe our choices to be out in the open breeze on bikes instead of inside a building at an office desk or waiting tables or driving a cab. It is liberating to tell the truth and to feel the breeze on your face as you ride. I don't feel like a murderer. I feel like a woman liberated from patriarchal control. Yeah. <laughs> which has been required of me for claiming that liberation, a cost I know is demanded of many of us who have done likewise. There are two Madisons that I'm addressing today. The first is the Madison Establishment Left, as represented by WORT 89.9 FM, the Wilmar Neighborhood Center, Wisconsin Network for Peace, Justice, and Sustainability, The Crystal Corner Bar, Tone Madison, and Our Lives Magazine. All of these established media outlets, organizations, and venues in Madison have excluded, defamed, and shunned me in the name of inclusivity because I have publicly made it known that I don't agree with the transgender narrative, that I dissent from its political demands. starting in 2014 with an interview I did with lesbian feminist scholar Sheila Jeffries. Yeah! 2014. <laughs> I have since then hosted other radio shows interviewing lesbians and feminists, and I even co-created my own radio station online called Women's Liberation Radio News. Woo! voices to be included in the mix of what Madison is. This, is. this establishment Madison works really hard at stomping out dissenting views on transgender politics, labeling all of us lesbian and radical feminists as right-wingers or exclusionary or even hateful and bigoted because we do not toe the dominant line that asserts that there are some special men with special gender identities who must be seen and accepted as female. The other Madison I wish to address in this speech is the Madison that values open and civil dialogue, that expresses progressive values from the rich progressive tradition we have in this state, and that works towards a true inclusivity that includes lesbians and radical feminists. This Madison is largely unknown due to suppression of their point of view. And when I say unknown, I mean the Isthmus newspaper won't cover it, Wisconsin State Journal, nobody. Um, and this is due to the suppression of, of this other Madison's point of view. But I know this Madison because it is this second Madison who showed up to the Wilmar Neighborhood Center board meeting on August 30th, 2019 to tell the Wilmar that they disagree with their ban on me performing on their stage, a stage I have performed on many times in the past. These nine supporters, <coughs> locals in our community who are environmentalists, herbalists, musicians and high quality people were ignored by the Wilmar Board of Directors at that meeting and then subsequently their letters and calls were ignored. Establishment Madison not only aims their vitriol at me, they ignore others who dare to stand up to them, hoping to send a message that if they speak up for women's rights, they may lose their livelihoods, their reputations and their sense of community and friendship in this town. But I've gained so many friends by doing this, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, I want to acknowledge your thing, feminists and struggle for creating the Defend Feminists Project shortly after learning about the Wilmar Neighborhood Center's ban on me in 2018. This small group of dedicated activists worked on that project for nearly two years before it became too burdensome and tiring to be ignored after hours and hours of documenting and petitioning in service to the cause of defending women like me from these kinds of attacks. 
But if you want to see the valiant efforts we made over those two years, please visit defendfeminists.net to read story after story of how Establishment Madison has suppressed and ignored lesbian and radical feminist voices and our supporters. Madison number one, Establishment Madison, will not permit me to even set foot in the Willie Street Co-op without the threat of confrontation by trans activists who think they have the right to approach me in public with their defamatory statements. Um, is this established Madison that chooses to highlight and apply the music of the band Dumpster Dick? And now you can put the slide up. This is a Madison band fronted by a man um, who claims to be female and he sings about burning women in dumpsters. His name is Christina Lane, the lead, and he's the lead singer of the band. And he was the main organizer of the campaign to get me fired from my job, my shows canceled at the Crystal Corner Bar, and to get me banned from performing on the Wilmar stage. Here's, and um, if you substitute the word woman for the word turf, you'll see how this term is used as a misogynistic slur in their logo there. Um, they want to burn women in dumpsters. And it's, I mean, this is an incitement to violence. Uh, or at least punish, it's punishment for disobeying the trans creed. And now um, here's, in contrast, a video of me performing with my band at the time, the Slum Thorns, um, up in, I think it was 2015 or 2016 at the Bartel Theater, which is a local theater really close um, up, up near the square. So that would be video two. Um, can you put the image of the video up there, please, Jenna? Let us play it. The image is not going. up there that was supposed to be up there of me playing and now and there's supposed to be an image for this next one too but will there be an image for this next one Jenna? video three okay so you heard that music now you're going to hear dumpster dick singing about burning women in dumpsters go ahead <laughs> to violence was welcomed at, on the stage at Mickey's Tavern, which is also on the Isthmus and in my neighborhood right down the street from the Crystal Corner Bar where I used to play a regular monthly show with my band. My question for Inclusive Establishment Madison is this, how is Madison's music scene and culture benefiting from the exclusion of me and my folk music and the inclusion of Dumpster Dick? a band whose very name screams misogyny. How is Madison's music scene enriched and enlivened by this choice to embrace Dumpster Dick and to ban Thistle and Thorns? For the record, I don't like Dumpster Dick's music, but I would never organize a group to demand they be banned from performing and blacklisted at the same venues my band used to play at. Like Francie says, everyone deserves music, even your worst enemy. And I am inclusive of Dumpster Dick's right to do music. Why isn't Madison big enough for both Dumpster Dick and Thistle and Thorns? How is our Mad Madison local culture? <laughs> elevated by this choice to exclude me? The answer, of course, is that it is not. It is dumbed down and it is dangerously moving into the territory of authoritarianism by including music or by excluding music that does not even talk about trans because it is not about them. Just because I did a few radio shows on WORT highlighting women's concerns about the incoherent concept of gender identity Establishment Madison is dumbing down Madison's music scene rather than lifting it up. Women are female and this fact is socially significant. Women are female and saying that we are is not hate speech. <laughs> In public 
spaces, such as at a restaurant, or on the community, such as at a restaurant, <laughs> or on the community radio station. The law rightly protects access by the public to public accommodations, prohibiting a refusal of service because of their sex, ethnicity, race, or personal beliefs in a free society. Access to the public airwaves used to be governed by the Fairness Doctrine, at least until the corporate capture of the FCC repealed the concept. But even then, our community-owned radio stations were supposed to be a place where, in the words of WORT's own mission statement, the station exists to serve a broad spectrum of the community by challenging the cultural and intellectual assumptions of our listeners through unique and diverse programming. We want to include everyone in these public spaces, or at least we used to. Now in the name of inclusion, we exclude women's challenges to some men's intellectual assumptions. Ooh. On such challenge, one such challenge is our assertion that there are times when we need to value boundaries in society, yes. such as those in private women's spaces, like showers, locker rooms, sports shelters, sports, shelters, and prisons. It is not exclusionary to exclude men from the definition of the word woman in the law and in our understanding of physical reality. Males are not a special kind of female. If they identify as trans or transgender fluid or non-binary. Whether you agree with my statements or not, I have the right to hold my view and express my opinion. My opinion that transgender politics is misogynistic and harmful to the sex-based rights of girls and women is not a call to hatred. It is a call for justice and dignity for the female half of our species. Loving women does not mean you are fostering a hatred for men or anyone else who may believe something you don't about reality. Our movement for women's liberation has faced this non sequitur for as long as women have stood up to advance our own self-interests. Let me back up for a moment. With the occupation of the Wisconsin Capitol building in 2011, the contemporary Occupy movement was transported from Kairos to Harrier Square to our shores, starting here in Madison. I have faith in our progressive community and in the solidarity we have built. I naively thought it would always be like that. You can put the next slide up. Um, so these are posters from that 2011 uprising, and I was there. I was sleeping up at the Capitol. I sang up at the Capitol. I was arrested for singing at the Capitol. I was um, one of the editors of the Occupation Zine that did a grassroots document. You know, we were documenting people's stories on the ground and all of their pictures, and we got a grant from um, the TAA, which is the union here at the UW Madison. Anyway, everybody was all united for like a uh, Paris Commune type situation for like two or three weeks and then, <laughs> and then you know, you know the history, a lot of Wisconsinites know the history of what happened, um, how the recall didn't work and all of that. But um, I took part in these protests and I am a progressive and I believe in the, and I have pride and power, I have pride in the power of progressive politics in our state and I was taken by surprise to learn that Madison would be this blind to such blatant hatred of women. The limited time available to me today to relate this story does not afford us the time to review the blow by blow of my experience with other venues and organizations in Madison who have behaved in very similar ways to the Wilmar Neighborhood Center and WORT 89.9 FM. But my question is as relevant to the Dane County Prosecuting Attorney's Office the Madison City Police Department, Our Lives Magazine, Bill Anderson, the Wilmar Neighborhood Center, particularly Beatrice Hadadian and Gary Callis, Eastside Acoustic Ensemble, particularly Rit Dietz, Tone Madison, particularly Emily Mills, Wisconsin Network for Peace, Justice, and Sustainability, particularly the seven board members who signed the February 3rd defaming statement, and WORT. Uh, particularly Board President David Devereaux Weber and News Director Sholly Pittman. I am left to ask, how has our community improved and felt better to all of us because, you're, because of your banning, shunning, ignoring, and ostracizing of me? How has our neighborhood improved since you decided to blacklist me and my band all the while, including a band who screams misogynistic lyrics into a microphone? Music is like sports in America. While the task of spectating is open to all, both music and sports offer elite opportunities only to the privileged few 
uh, only the privileged few enjoy participating in. But like the acclaimed pop musician Michael Franti says in the song you just heard, everyone deserves music, even your worst enemy. <laughs> Um, so it's not just the winners like Emma Wayans, the real NCAA women's swimming champ. Access to sports opportunities. Think of the soccer team at your local elementary school. All of those children deserve access to team sports to feel a sense of belonging and to participate both cooperatively and competitively in a fair environment. Not to mention all children deserve access to sports education to stay physically fit. The same goes for musical opportunities at our local public schools. All children benefit from having access to musical experiences in groups, such as in the swing choir, in band, or in a musical performance. When I was in high school, I remember asking my guitar teacher why boys could play the guitar better than girls. She responded by saying, don't let them fool you. The only way they could get good on the guitar is by practicing, and you can too. <laughs> um, so that was back in the 1980s here in Madison. A lot has changed. I practiced almost as much as my guitar teacher encouraged me to do, and I eventually found my voice as a singer-songwriter, finally at about the age of 30, when I lived for a brief while in Michigan attending graduate school. I came back to Madison in 2000 built, and built up my local networks, including at WORT in the Wilmer, Wilmer Neighborhood Center, both places in our Madison community that I have been going to since the 1980s. In 2003, I took off on my bicycle for three years with my partner at the time, and we played folk music along the way to support ourselves. Next slide. And basically to see the country from the seat of a bicycle. This is a pic of me playing a show on that bike music tour in 2003. I contacted peace and justice organizations ahead of time to book the shows. And it, we did, it was a gas fast. There was no motorized vehicle that was supporting us. We were eco primitives driving our bikes. I had my guitar and a trailer. Um, in late 2006, when I returned to Madison, I was accepted into the Drumlin Community Gardens Collective that I lived in, for two, that lived in two old farmhouses on the edge of town, just over the line into Fitchburg. Next slide, please. I lived there in intentional community, organizing among the Latino families who were our neighbors first, who were our neighbors, to plant on the farmland near the two houses we rented with the intention to build an anti-racist community neighborhood farming project that was in active resistance to the Alexander Company, a development company that wished to build a hotel and parking lot right on top of the gardens we were cultivating. Joni Mitchell had it right. By 2009, the Drumlin project had ended, but not without us putting up quite a fight to stop the land from being paved over. And this is just one poster, an example of like the benefit shows that we would do, I mean, um, and building intentional communities. You see the skeletons on bikes. That's um, a big theme with uh, bike activists. During this period, I hosted an open mic in Madison at the Mercury Lounge up by the Bartel Theater around the square. It was there that I met lots of local musicians who became collaborators, and Thistle and Thorns was born back in 2008. This band put together an album in 2012 and went on tour around Wisconsin and Illinois in 2011 and 2012. Next slide. Um, so this is, you see the skeletons on bicycles and the thorny, the thorny crowns with roses and the thistle and her thorns going on tour during Earth Week, so this very week, um, nine years ago. Um, I note that the Earth First Journal said this about uh, my music. Thistle's voice is provocative and powerful. With raspy realism, her lyrics paint a picture of life on the road via bicycle, rage about the killing of the Earth, and a commitment to fight back. I just wanted to point that out in case it wasn't abundantly clear by now that contradicting what Emily Mills says about me and the feminists that I work with, I am about the farthest thing from a Republican right winger you could possibly be. Okay, next slide. By 2013, I was known as a Madison singer songwriter and was asked to play shows around town for different benefit concerts and events often events that I helped to organize because throughout this time, I have also been a local activist with Madison Action for Mining Alternatives, or MAMA, and with the Act 10 protests and the no F-35 jets in Madison. By 2016, and um, I had booked my own monthly show at the Crystal Corner Bar, and I finally felt like I was carving off the little musical career and niche my heart and, and soul had craved my whole life. 
I would play with my band at the Crystal Corner every fourth Monday. We would often order a pizza and I would chat with everyone after my set. It was a community event that many people enjoyed. But all of that has changed because Christina Lane and his associates bombarded the bar's management and owner with stories of my alleged hateful bigotry until the show was canceled for good. The shows were canceled for good in February of 2017. It's at the point now that I have no place to go, like Francie sings in the song I played at the beginning of this speech, and I still got the music in my soul. Last year I put out, change the slide, last year I put out an album with an old friend from high school who is also a regular WORT volunteer, Matthew Sanborn, Sanborn called Spinning of Weaving. Spinning and Weaving, of note, none of the notes and lyrics on this album are about trans politics. My life and my musical work are not about autogynophilic men and their hurt feelings. I have not touched on the subject in my musical work. You can hear my music critical of gender ideology and its adverse impact on women by visiting WRN's SoundCloud page. I do have songs that make statements about this issue, but this is not my reason for existing. Their fetishes are so tiring and so unrelated to who I am in so many ways. And my story is not unique. Let's, forget, let's not forget that women have been systematically excluded from the music world, just like we have been in sports. The New York Times reported on a study in 2018 that reviewed the top 600 <laughs> tunes from 2012 to 2017. They looked at the billboard charts. The research study discovered that 1,239 performing artists, of that number, only 22.4% of them were women. These numbers continue to go down as trans inclusion rhetoric increases and women are pushed out of their music careers and back into more traditional roles for women. Let's stop excluding females from music and sports, male-dominated arenas since before the trans trend came along. And please, Madison, it was just a sticker. Felony hate crime charges? Really? <laughs> children under the banner of gender identity affirmation. A radical feminist for 15 years, Jeanette writes about the possibilities of womanhood at DearDaughterLoveMom, all one word, dot com, with the goal of gender abolition. Please welcome Jeanette. Yeah, Jeanette! Tonight. It is not a bra, I have no need for one for that. It is not a cat, I have many. <laughs> what 
what I need is for every one of us to give gratitude to the women who have made this event possible, our sisters. God, the girls and old crones, those who have shared their hands and their hearts, dedicated their dollars and their time, moved mountains and materials, the people at podiums, and the one present in this room to bear witness to these stories and this day that we stand together in solidarity with one another. We need each and every one of us. No one of us is expendable, not disposable, not erasable, not transitionable. most beautiful sounds speak aloud with deep gratitude for the sisters who have come before you and the ones who will come after you, but especially the ones who are here with us in this room at this moment. Please join with me now to say thank you, sisters. Thank, thank you, sisters! And today, I ask for courage. It is you who have brought us to this moment, this place, this time, this public platform to share ideas and practice that messiness that is the pluralistic democracy of America, and here we are. You brought me here, and now look at me asking you for more. But you can do it. You are capable of giving me the strength to speak, the wall of a womanly welcome with your voices. You can speak this word aloud in those voices that brought a smile to my face. I ask you now, in your most powerful, most fierce voice, to shout aloud, courage. Courage! 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 courage. Now that I am certain that you know what it means, that you have practiced it with your voice, I am certain that you will be here with me Walk with me as I drag us through this mess. Yay. Today, I will talk about mothers and what we owe them. We all have one. I have one. She is watching this happen right now online. <laughs> when we hear the word mother. She is our mother, but she is also our sister. Each mother, including our own, is also our sister because it is she who, along with us, lives under the thick blanket of patriarchy. I ask you, my sisters, to consider each mother, every mother, as a sister, one who was born into sisterhood, just as you were, as I was, from the time of your conception to the moment of your birth, female, and thus deserving a space in our sisterhood. This is going to be complicated. It is going to be messy. I personally know a number of mothers of trans-identified children. I have read and heard the stories of even more mothers whose children describe themselves as some sort of trans. None of these mothers gave birth to unicorns. I do not believe in unicorns. None of these mothers gave birth to unicorns, and thus their children are either female or male human beings and will always be so. I do not believe in unicorns, and I do not believe in this mythological creature called a trans child. There is no such creature. This is mythology, a story that we tell ourselves to make meaning of a phenomenon that makes us uncomfortable. But this insistent, persistent, and consistent myth requires that we pull our heads out of the sand, stop believing in unicorns, and acknowledge that we have more work to do. Describing these unicorns, decorating them with rainbows and glitter, styling their hair, giving them names, platforming, and placating them, the more unicorn shit we will have to clean up when we realize they are not unicorns who defecate cotton candy, but yes. horses. <laughs> horses whose muscles have never gained strength, whose brains have never been allowed to solve problems on their own, whose bodies have atrophied beyond repair, whose natural instincts have been worn down while trapped inside the cages of the man-made, man-marketed, man-centered unicorn land. No matter how a child feels, exactly zero of them were born in the wrong body. Yeah! children from 
from this mess. It is time to clean it up. I am a mother. I gave birth to a girl. Her name is Sophia. Please manifest her presence in this room by saying her name, Sophia, aloud with me. Sophia! She has been the absolute love of my life. And I continue to be grateful that some sort of miracle brought her into my life as my one and only child. If I would describe her to you now, I would need piles of dictionaries, mountains of synonyms, truckloads of analogies, but they would all equal the same word amazing. But while gasping for breath under the heavy blanket of patriarchy, she saw an opening, not toward liberation, but downward, toward the false flame that is gender. Yeah. She carved her path toward that light, as has become normal for an adolescent girl seeking relief from the stifling suffocation that accompanies an entry into the body of a woman and into a society determined to sexualize her spirit. Despite spending her August summers from age two at the land in Michigan that many of us call home, she had not yet grown to believe that sisterhood was a path to power and peace. That truth had not yet seeped in to fill the marrow of her bones. Despite her favorite female voices of Stacy and Chin, Melissa Ferrett, and of course Lisa Vogel, my daughter would need more time to grow before her bones and brain would be strong enough to hold the knowledge that her femaleness is her superpower. That girlhood is significant. And that no one, not even she, can escape the awesomeness that we were born as and the awfulness that we were born into. It is all at once a divine blessing on our sex and a burden so heavy that it continuously pulls our heads below the blanket, leaving us gasping and grasping for the hands of our sisters. And in that moment, some of us, including our youngest sisters, grab onto the hands that lead them closer to the false flame that will burn them. <coughs> My daughter declared her trans identification on July 23rd, 2019, the morning after I dropped her off for a custodial visit to her father's house. I did not know that I would not see her alone again, have a private conversation <laughs> with her, not be able to share space with this girl who I birthed and loved for nearly 13 years before that day in July. Today marks 1,006 days since the final day of her childhood with me, the final day of my motherhood with her, the final day that I stopped breathing oxygen and I started breathing fire. <laughs> but it is not my motherhood on which I wish to reflect today. I have spent many nights waiting for the sun to come back Spending that time in the darkness, tears blurring my vision, saliva dripping from my mouth as I heaved up the grief. The realization that I had lost her, that the ties that bound us together were so easily broken by a few words, a few lies, and a few adults who failed to act in her best interests, but succeeded in serving their own at her expense. I thought that surely my heart would recognize that it was broken beyond repair, that it should stop beating and put me out of my misery. But that is the thing about the body. It is not something we can control for better or worse. Since those days of despair, I have unburied the sun and I carry her with me. <coughs> she lights my path. And hopefully she can light yours too when you cannot find your own light, when you have not yet unburied your son and do not yet know how to keep yourself warm in that darkness. That darkness that is not forever. Sisters, you gave me that sun, that warmth, that light, when you gave me courage just a few moments ago. And now I ask you more for more courage as we get deeper into this mess. Please, sisters. Feed me again with your voices. Let me hear you say it. Courage. Courage! Thank you. Now walk with me to survey this mess. Today I reflect on the mothers I see in this landscape before I focus on one particular mother who needs our compassion and our sisterhood. 
mothers in this are not a monolith. After nearly three years observing with curiosity and reflection, I have come to see a certain number of things that I cannot unsee. First, the mothers who hold the line and hold up a mirror to themselves. These are the mothers who cannot lie to their children. These are the mothers who are pushed and pulled and posted as pariahs on playgrounds and parent-teacher conferences because they will not play the pronoun game. These are the mothers who suffer the isolation of family and friends deserting them, left and right, uninviting, unfriending, blocking, and backstabbing. It is these mothers who are learning the hard way, who is capable of caring, capable of coming to the table, bringing her a meal, holding her steady when she is ready to fall. These are the mothers who need you and me and us. These mothers have strength, but they need more. These mothers have courage, but they need more. Let us speak to these mothers in this moment, giving them the courage that they need, giving them what they need to hold the line that will protect their children from the harms of gender identity. Please give them what they are owed. Please, sisters, I want to hear you say thank you. Thank, thank you. you! Now, sisters, give them the strength to continue to hold the line, please let me hear you give them courage. Courage! Mothers, did you hear that? Did you hear the voices of the women who will go with you to the school board meeting, stand with you as you testify at the state house, sit with you while you cry? Did you hear the voices giving you the courage to ask for the help that you need? You deserve their help because you, my mothers, holding the line, have held a mirror toward yourself. You have done the work. You have done, dug deep inside yourself and your past and acknowledged those ways that you have failed to be the perfect mother. You have compassion for your child. You acknowledge that your child has suffering, has suffered and is suffering, and you are doing the work of holding the line with compassion for yourself and for your child. <coughs> you have looked at your actions in the past, dissected the patterns and pitfalls of living a life led from a place of unprocessed, unprepared, and unrepentant trauma. You have committed to being a better mother because you can. You have grown, you have made a new life, new friends, new ways of being. You have carved a path forward for yourself that is not just a road running parallel to the road that you were traveling before you have grown. You have done exactly what you have told your children not to do. You have met strangers on the internet, become friends with them, learn to smile more, and cry less. You have learned that your supply of tears is finite, but your supply of laughter is not. And these women, my sisters in this room, and those hearing my voice, will stand beside you. We commit to showing and sharing our power with you to end this mess. Yes. Let us say it once again to these mothers holding the line, let us give them courage. Courage! It is time, my sisters, to consider the other mothers. And this is a mess. Mothers who carved a parallel path. The mothers who hold the line, but you dare not cross it. These mothers are not so easy to call sisters. These are the mothers who need more time, more strength, and more of something they can only give themselves. These are the mothers who Jennifer Billick actually accurate, accurately describes as the ROGD parent, a whole and complete identity mirroring the same patriarchal system, same cult-like qualities, same inability to grow, same mirror on their chest facing toward everyone else, same learned behaviors that their children have, but the difference is they are adults, not children. Mm -hmm. They have much more agency over their lives than they are willing to admit. They seem to seek your sympathy, but it is sinister. Mm -hmm. They may not play the pronoun game, but they play many others. They find fault in everyone and everything but themselves. Mm -hmm. These mothers appear to hold the line, but they are trapped inside <laughs> themselves, and if you are not careful, they will trap you too. But these women, 
our sisters. So what do we do with that? And I call upon you to have compassion for these mothers too. These mothers have lived inside the system of patriarchy that taught them this self-centeredness, that taught them that their worth is given by someone else, that taught them that their identity is wholly and completely enmeshed and immersed inside the identity of someone else. Hold compassion for these mothers too, but keep yourself outside of their line. You will be sucked in so swiftly spit out so quickly and trauma will be multiplied and unmanaged and messy. Hold yourself close to them, but hold yourself steady. Help them out of their mistakes, but do not allow yourself to make your own. Give support, but do not enable. Let me speak to these mothers at this moment. Sister, I can see that your trauma has taught you that you are the one who is suffering the most and are powerless to forces beyond your control, that you have no choice but to dedicate your time, your emotions, your tears to this movement, but that is a lie. You deserve a life, sister. You deserve to be human. You deserve to build a life for yourself that is not codependent, not enmeshed, not transactional, all patterns that you probably learned from a very young age. You deserve the vibrant variety of living a life that is <coughs> mundane, finding beauty in the everyday, finding joy in the normal, finding contentment outside of controversy and turmoil. Doing this work should be one thing, not everything in your life. You, sister, deserve the fullness that comes from building and breathing new dreams. And you can start today, at this moment, right now. Sister, you must no longer use the crutch of victimhood, no longer repeat the story of woe is me, no longer sit in the sinking ship waiting for someone else to rescue you, you must grow. It is time we all stand in solidarity with you as you choose to grow. Now, I call upon my sisters in this room at this moment to manifest this change in these mothers who have struggled for too long using reasons as excuses. It is time to grow. This is what we owe these mothers. Together in sisterhood, let us create this change for our <coughs> sister mothers by speaking the word manifest. Manifest. And our most treasured gift. Let us, let us give it freely to these sister mothers, the word that will give them the power to begin the first step of self-reflection. Let us speak the words into their body, courage. Courage! Now sisters, it is time to get deeper into this mess. Come with me to see the compound that is the global gender industry and the mothers who consume this poison and feed it to their children. Believing it will cure them of this disease called childhood, they are the affirmers. These are the mothers who play pronoun games, believe in unicorns, and cannot bear witnessing the distress of their child being human, their backbones collapsing under the weight they are weak. They cannot bear standing present with their children, watching their emotions inside this social media manipulated, peer pressure, cooked misogynistic mess. These mothers have been taught to believe that they are responsible for fixing <coughs> everything, of making everyone smile, of making it all go away. They have been trained to make themselves and this place look pretty, but it is not pretty. Their method of madness will never serve to clean up this mess because they are pulling at the vines rather than pulling at the roots. Mm -hmm. Their signs are pink and blue pretty, but their hearts still be red. Mm. They are fighting against their intuition because they are alone. Mm. These mothers do not have the strength that comes when you stand aside your sisters in solidarity. These mothers are scared of losing their family, losing their friends, losing their jobs, and losing their child. Right. And it is up to you, to me, to us, to hold the truth in front of our face, but not shove it down their throats. It is up to you, to me, to us, to set a space at our table 
to invite and invite and invite again to show these mothers what strength looks like, what sisterhood looks like, and what they gain when they pick up the line and hold it. are my sisters, that they are women and women are human, that we must be present with them, share space with them, and carry compassion to them. And what these mothers need most is courage. Their intuition has been buried so deeply from teachers and neighbors and therapists and media and doctors and our government. The layers of lies littering her brain must be unpacked piece by piece until sparks of truth can light her path out of this mess. These mothers are doing the best they can, and they are failing to protect their children. Because they are our sisters, we must help them if we wish all children to be protected. No one will be abandoned in our sisterhood. We need each and every one of us, and we are all capable of growing. Let us create space for these sister mothers to grow in our presence. <coughs> Let us give them water, let us give them light, let us give them courage. Say it now with me to all of the mothers who need strength to speak the intuitive truth that is still inside of us. Let us give them courage. Courage! I have brought you to the deepest point in this mess, but I am not done. You will need a shovel from here. There is one mother who needs your strength of sisterhood and your courage and compassion. She is the wife of my husband, the mother who has helped fertilize the vines that are choking my daughter. Before my daughter left our home for the last time, on July 22nd, 2019, my daughter spoke with this mother, this licensed clinical social worker, this therapist, this woman with whom I had never even had one conversation. From this moment with my only child, this mother decided that she was going to save my daughter, being a warrior for her cause, filling her cup of virtue with my flesh and blood. This mother never called me. This mother never weaved a web of support for my daughter, strong ties of women who might guide her out of this mess, no. This mother built walls and it became darker and darker for my daughter. Having left her sunshine at our home on that day in July when she departed and I didn't know she would never return again There was a plan and this mother this gardener of weeds Guided my daughter through a dark forest disorienting her taking her adolescent thought of I think I'm trans and rather than using the brain that a good goddess gave her she pulled out poison <coughs> This mother fed my daughter the lie that my transphobia might actually kill her, that my truth might actually shine so much light that it would burn her, and that my love needed to be replaced by the hollowness of validation by words, not deeds. No child will kill herself if she hears her birth name. <coughs> Our girls are stronger than that. Mm -hmm. I am tired of too many people telling them they are weak, they are not. Mm -hmm. My daughter will rise. Yes. She will not stay buried under this mess. She is incapable of staying stagnant inside the lie that is transgenderism. That's right. She will grow. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. The seeds have been planted, and even before she left our home, I saw signs. Mm -hmm. When his mother asked my daughter over text, maybe your mom thinks she's a man. Yeah. Oh, God. My daughter could not stop herself from writing in all caps, my mother would never think that. <laughs> <laughs> What we all know that being trans is a lie. She knows what a woman is. Everyone knows. <coughs> so this mother, this lost soul of a sister who has taken up a sword to slice the ties between my flesh and blood and my body, this mother, she needs you. She needs you to create space for her to grow. She needs you to hold the line. She needs to see a wall of women ready to welcome her into the sisterhood of strength that will allow her to grow out of the rock that she is living under. She needs you. 
She deserves compassion. <coughs> she deserves to know that there is another way, another path, a way to retie the ropes that she cut, clean up the blood that was spilled, grow the spine that she lacks. Mm -hmm. She must know that sisterhood is for her as it is for every woman, every girl, every female that is forced from the womb into this mess. Because I have asked you for something that may seem impossible, I must now give some of my courage to you. <laughs> the truth is that you have given, you are given at birth a number of things that you can control and a host of things that you cannot. As someone who has been lucky enough to spend 44 years on this earth, I can advise that you spend your time focusing on those things that you can control and accepting and even loving those things that you cannot control because it is those things that if you try to control them will suck the marrow out of your bones. You can control only one person and she is yourself. Focus on her. She is the greatest weapon in this fight and she is ready to grow and she must if you are able and wanting to do this work. She needs this, this woman, this mother. She deserves this, this courage. But I, I am not capable in this moment of giving it to her. That's okay. And I ask you, my sisters, to have the courage to give her what is owed, what she deserves. She deserves so much, but she deserves this. I am asking you in this moment, at this time, to give her what is not possible for me to give. Someday I will be able to give her the compassion and courage that she deserves, but that day is not today. She is capable of doing more, and it is up to you to call upon her to grow. In this place, at this moment, I need you to share again what you have given to me today, again and again and again. Say aloud with me the word that gives the strength of solidarity, courage. Courage! Thank you. She deserves that. It is a beautiful day outside, but there is so much warmth and light in this room. Will you please stay with me, feeling this warmth? Seeing the light of us shine from this stage, stay with me. More sisters are going to speak, and what a blessing it is upon us to hear their voices. Blessed be. Blessed be. Blessed be. Oh, thank you so much. <coughs> Pursuing guerrilla approaches to fighting trans ideology. She invites women to imagine a future free of the impositions and requirements of the patriarchy. Thank you, and please welcome Jessica. All right, Jessica! That's right. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jessica Gonzalez, and I'm a Scottish The name of this event is Courage Calls to Courage, and I want to use this time I have to call on your courage. My personal opinion is that we do not have enough women that have shown up to be counted in this fight, and we will need many more in order to win, and the sooner they show up, the better. Mm -hmm. There are men that stand against the agenda of trans ideology, and conservatives that stand against it too, 
but I believe that for our success on this issue, to be genuinely emancipatory, we will need more women. Yes. 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 We will need to show up to build that critical mass that it will take. There's simply no way around that. This talk I'm about to give is most directed at the average everyday women that are just like me and or where I was this time last year, very much aligned with the objectives, immersed in the online culture, but not yet very concretely involved in the effort. There are plenty of women like me who are uncancelable. We work in industries where gender ideology has not yet taken root mm -hmm. or where adherence to it isn't being enforced. Some of us might not work for an employer at all. Some of us are even retired or work in the home in some capacity. There is energy to be tapped there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I recognize that many women are not in that same situation. And even many women that are uncancelable don't exactly realize it yet because we've been bombarded with this messaging about how forbidden it is to be a Turk. Mm -hmm. Let me start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I ended up here on this panel right now and why you should listen to me. <laughs> Like Dr. Hale mentioned, I'm just an average woman. I work a blue collar union job that takes up almost all of my time. I don't write books or even have a YouTube show or anything like that. I consider myself an ordinary soldier in the struggle to liberate women and girls from patriarchy. Last year, I began to take up organizing and led and participated in several protests across the country. What makes me special enough to be here speaking to you today is that around this time last year, I had two ideas that really kind of took off. The first was Turf Collective, and the second was our target action. All right. Turf Collective is a group that was born when it occurred to me that all we turfs on Facebook that spent so much time trolling trans identity supremacy activists and even each other might be served by having regular meetings. The vision was simply for a time and space where we could come together and talk. I see it as a feminist assembly of sorts. The goal was to gather the women where they already are, which of course was Facebook. There was no agenda and no goal, just a sisterhood circle to talk about our struggle against trans ideology. What I originally wanted was for us to create an online army uh, from as many charts on Facebook as we could round up. I wanted us to actually coordinate the way we spend all the time we do arguing with TRAs on the internet. Mm. I envisioned mapping it out so that we could identify women that are close to peeking and providing them <laughs> with the critical information that it would take to get them to see and understand the consequences of the agenda. Imagine a coordinated campaign of virtual canvassing. I haven't fully abandoned that vision, but the ever worsening censorship on social media might make that too difficult to ever pursue, mm. let's be honest. We cannot possibly speak plainly about the biological realities of males and females and the social realities <coughs> of patriarchy, and especially the role of transgender ideology within that framework without catching a swift and immediate ban on all social media platforms. Well, what happens at Turf Collective? Everything. Women come by to share the struggle of living with people that believe in trans ideology. We talk about falling out with family and friends over our differences. We talk about strained relationships, fear at work, ideas for combating the narrative. Most importantly of all, we come together to reassure one another that no matter what experience you've just recently had that has made you feel like you are all alone and the walls are closing in, that you are not and they are not. Mm -hmm. We also platform really difficult conversations about feminism in general. 
the place of race in radical feminism and what boundaries must and should be respected by women of different races in order to build a real solidarity, for example. We talk about the fourth industrial revolution and the connections between transgenderism and transhumanism. That's right. Mm -hmm. We talk about whether we can work with and trust any men. We no. talk about whether we can and should work with conservatives and if so, to what extent. I will say as an aside, the Etcher Collective largely do support the use of right-wing platforms. Because we're generally all in agreement that we won't win this battle from a place of obscurity. <laughs> By far, our favorite topic to discuss remains activism. We love to talk about our ideas. We love to hear a good idea and add to it. We love to hear reports from sisters that just undertook an action. How did it go? Was there good engagement? Did we get a lot of support? Any detractors? Tell us everything. We have nowhere to go, we can be here all night. <laughs> Dirt Collective now boasts over 600 members across two Facebook groups with several dozen attending our regular meetings. Nice. Although our meetings are the main thrust of our existence, many of our members have never been to them. They just work on our campaigns and protests completely out of sight and remain unknown even to other members. Mm -hmm. Before I go any further, I'd like to briefly address our embracing the term term. Yeah. I've said what I'm about to say before. Women are being re-traumatized at rape crisis centers, mental <coughs> birth groups, sexually assaulted by so-called lesbian men in single sex spaces, and all our hard-earned social and political allocations, even sports and scholarships are all being hemorrhaged. At a time like this, we refuse to be diverted into a debate about being called terps. In fact, if standing for the dignity of those women makes us terps, I've said this before and will say it a thousand times, we would be deeply ashamed indeed not to be terps. <laughs> unconvinced and underwhelmed by this explanation and continue to have grave concerns about our appropriation of the term, please rest assured we simply do not care. <laughs> we are quite busy and focused on the projects we're undertaking to promote tangible sex-based rights and protections for women and girls and are well beyond being bothered to argue uh, over questions of semantics and philosophy. So please, let the mind rest. <laughs> our group initially ran our meetings right on Facebook. Within the Facebook group itself, using the video conferencing feature, it offers called Rooms. And I didn't do course this, by the no. way. Yeah. We quickly outgrew that feature, the Rooms feature that is, noticing that it would only allow maybe 15 women on a call at one time before it stopped admitting new participants. The goal was to create a table where every turf we knew and trusted had a seat, so therefore naturally this would not work. <laughs> I ended up buying a Zoom account with a surprise COVID bonus I received from my second job at a big box hardware store to handle all the participants. Well, the number of women on any call varies. We sometimes get as many as 40 women on a single call, and I don't ever recall hosting a meeting with less than a dozen women. <coughs> After two months, I had to quit my second job in order to make time for the workload of administering the group, moderating the meetings, and boosting our activism. By June, we had over 400 members across two separate Facebook groups, and in August, due to demand, we even began selling t-shirts. Ooh. I'm telling you about Turf Collective because as I mentioned, it was one of the ideas last night that I had last year that brought me here, but I also wanted to tell you about Turf Collective because I want you to copy it. I want you to get a Zoom account or a Jitsi account, or maybe you'll start a chat or call group on WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram or Discord. Start your own group for turfs that meet regularly to discuss the most important questions we are all dealing with right now. What are we going to do? 
and how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. I am practically begging you to do this. There shouldn't be a single turf collective. There should be turf collectives. Mm. What I noticed is that a lot of first timers at our meetings, <laughs> about a lot of first timers at our meetings, is that they couldn't stop talking. They were just over the moon to be in a room of turfs. We don't believe in transgender ideology. When some women come to their first turf collective meeting, they breathe a sigh of relief. They can speak freely on this issue, maybe for the first time, literally ever. The community we built was obviously filling a previously unmet need. I have no doubt there are women out there right now still in desperate need of face-to-face -face community and solidarity building with other sisters, and we should keep forming, forming groups to provide such community. It's a little hard to get into our group right now because we're kind of running waitlist. But you can and should have your own if you know enough women to organize your own and you really only need one or two other women to start. Even if you only meet a few times and fizzle out, that is still a success. The fact you managed to connect at all is a triumph. This will probably sound corny, but I genuinely believe that any time women share space to talk about the harms of patriarchy, we are winning a small battle within a larger war. Yeah. If you're not currently in a women's discussion group, please do whatever you can to find your way to one. Women's Declaration International runs an amazing group after their weekly feminist question time sessions where I've met some incredible women. They are also branching out into general discussion groups for non women here in the States and they have regular volunteer meetings. Just try to go to a bunch of meetings. <laughs> Whichever ones you can get into and start talking to other women that share your views on this issue. Listen to their ideas and share your own. Share what's holding you back. Share the limitations that you will rec already recognize in yourself and share what you have to offer. Be earnest and be honest. Before I move on from this topic, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to acknowledge the great debt the Turk Collective owes Thistle Patterson. Thistle <laughs> is, of course, why we're all in Madison, Wisconsin today. She has been toiling diligently for over five years now, archiving the contemporary radical feminist movement. Six and that, years. Six years. Five years. Sorry. And that deserves our recognition and deep gratitude. Thank you, Thistle. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Radical feminism will indeed remember Thistle Patterson. Thistle yes. was one of our first members and remains one of our most enthusiastic supporters. She was the first to give me a platform and have me speak about Turk Collective. She was the first person in a position to take Turk Collective seriously that did take Turk Collective seriously. She's very important to Turk Collective and to the movement in general. This past summer, this as we all know, was charged in the city for a crime that doesn't yet even exist in this jurisdiction. Namely, hate speech, specifically around the nebulous and forcible notion of gender identity. This charge was brought on the basis of her having allegedly placed a term collective sticker on a magazine box. To this day, I still have no earthly idea who put that fucking sticker there. <laughs> <laughs> I attended this hearing, which was held virtually. The district attorney quickly conceded that Madison has no foundation for a charge of hate crime against church speech as gender identity is not a class covered by the hate crime statute. Yeah. The judge held that the speech was protected by the First Amendment. With that, Thistle was the woman that single-handedly showed in a court of law that Church Collective won't leash.
Collective was just a sort of headquarters. For Facebook Trends in early June, I had an idea that would change who we are and what we do. This brings me to the second good idea I had last year, our target action. In 2016, Target decided to get ahead of the curve in its support of trans ideology and changed its bathroom policy. The new policy meant that everyone could use the bathroom and changing rooms to matching their gender identity and not their nail sex. American conservatives have carried out a massive boycott of Target in response to this new policy. Well, ultimately, the boycott was determined to have a bit of an impact on Target's profits. It was not enough to force them to change their policy. Not even close. In 2018, the man that runs the website womanmeansomething.com collected all the news reports of sexual assaults that had taken place within Target stores since the new bathroom policy was imposed. What he found once we collected all the data was that there was indeed an increase in incidences of voyeurism in changing rooms since Target had announced the policy. Upon stumbling upon an article about this, I thought that Target should protest by placing many flyers with information from the study at Target stores. Naturally, I figured they should go to the bathrooms. There, the information would be presented at the scenes of the crime, so to speak. I brought this idea to our next meetings, and it was determined that the best way to distribute the flyers was not to put the flyers in the bathrooms. The bathrooms were clean and used so often that so many, by so many people that at any moment after placement, any employee or trans identity supremacist could simply grab them all and throw them in the trash. We thought of potentially printing them as stickers and sticking them up in the bathroom and changing rooms that wouldn't work similarly because as soon as they were spotted by management they would be taken down and our protest would be very short-lived indeed and would just be a punishment for whichever unfortunate retail right. was charged with uh, was tasked with the scraping the very one the very <coughs> same woman that drew up our target action flyer gave us our best solution she said put the flyers in the bags the handbags the handbags in the pockets. It was brilliant. From there, we were off and running, listing all the places in the actual merchandise to be purchased where we could stash the flyers. The possibilities were endless, painted liner boxes, jeans, back pockets, outerwear, even romance novels. <laughs> Anything that was likely to be purchased and used by an adult human female was worthy of receipt of a flyer. This way, we were assured that nearly every flyer we placed would reach our target demographic. I threw together an initial social media post, which included a picture of the flyer and doubles as a file to be printed to participate, and some tips and tricks on how to do it. That silly little idea really kind of took off. To date, we've placed nearly 10,000 flyers and merchandise in Target stores. <laughs> from Vermont, New York, Virginia, Illinois, Minnesota, Washington, California, and of course, Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> For as long as their bathroom policy remains based on the false notion of gender identity, this <laughs> protest is valid. You could be watching this video in five years and you can grab that flyer and you can go do it. The goal of the protest is not to get Target to change its policy. The goal of the protest is to use the policy and the results of the policy as an opportunity mm -hmm. to share information that has the potential to peak more women. We're trying to bring to their attention that this kind of thing is already in place, mm -hmm. which even I didn't know. And no one will ask you whether you're okay with it or not. And these, and there are these terrible consequences of the policies that you didn't ask for and that if you're smart, you wouldn't want. Now on to my ask. I'm here to ask, to beg, that you come to the fight against gender ideology. I don't mean watch the talks like this one and read the articles and share the memes and links on your social media accounts. 
that's good. And I don't want you to stop doing that. Definitely keep doing that. But what I'm asking you is to begin to challenge yourself to do more. I'm asking you to become an activist. We seem to be turning a corner on this issue and I think now is the time. I'm asking you for courage, but let's face it, I'm not asking for that much of it. If you waited until now, until joining the fight, you're in luck. The tide seems to be turning and things, frankly, I believe are getting easier. I'll talk a little bit about why I think that. Last summer in New York City, I organized and led a small but very impressive group of valiant women in protest in July. This protest was at Rockefeller Center, which was displaying the Olympic rings as part of the Olympics ring roadshow promotion for the television airing of their summer games. You will all recall this most recent Summer Olympics featured not one but three men admitted to the women's category in their sport. The most famous, of course, being Laurel Hubbard. He's a man. And by the way, his birth name is Gavin. <laughs> I do admit, um, I, I, I was actually quite nervous about going into the demonstration in New York City. Anytime you feel responsible for other people's safety is very stressful and you do feel that when people agree to come out with you to demonstrate. This is also this was also on the heels of the We Spot incident and the ensuing protests. Everyone will remember the We Spot incident where a man named Gary Marauder entered the women's area naked at a Los Angeles spa, exposing himself to several women and even a young girl. A woman that, to the best of my knowledge, remains more largely known by her Instagram handle, Kulana Angel, uploaded footage of herself and other women confronting We Spa staff over the presence of a man in the women's area. Kumana Angel calls for a protest of We Spa on her social media, and my understanding is to actually took place. <laughs> well, I've only um, watched footage from one. I have to admit, it, it really was terrifying. I don't really scare, but I found the videos of what unfolded at the counter press protest in LA, frankly, nerve wracking. Uh, considering, especially, I had a protest of my own <laughs> in a major metropolitan area not 10 days later. The footage showed men brutally attacking each other. There were a couple of stabbings, and feminists were bullied, taunted, and in my opinion, genuinely assaulted. And the strangest thing, although there were police stationed in the area, specifically in case the situation devolved, they never actually did anything. If the trans activists in a, could do it in LA, why couldn't they do it in New York City? I still think about what happened in LA at that protest and how it got so bad. The truth is I really don't know. I can't figure it out. But the events of the We Spa protest were weighing on me as I planned the Olympic rings protest in New York. My feeling was that if we didn't pull this off safely, we would set back our movement because we will have shown that LA was not a fluke and that turfs just aren't safe to publicly express our views in this country. On July 24th, 2021, I led a group of a dozen women, including women from Women's Declaration International, Peak Prison Single Sex, as well as other feminist activists, in the protest at Rockefeller Center. I tried to be strict and keep everyone together. I felt like I was doing a head count every 10 minutes of the two hours we were out there. Over the two hours, we gave brief speeches on the harms of transgender ideology, especially regarding sports, and we chanted until we got worse. We received what I consider life heckling by three separate young people. They were walking alone and therefore, and therefore much less of a threat. When I noticed a young woman making facial expressions that seemed to indicate she was becoming incensed by our demonstration, I literally pulled women back <laughs> to the shady spot under the tree that had served as our base so that she wouldn't engage and would simply keep walking. And she did. 
at another point, we were getting heckled by a young woman that was crossing the street behind us. And they're always young women. Yeah. 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 At another point, we were getting heckled by a young woman that was crossing the street behind us. And one of our participants that I had not had a chance to interrupt on Grey Rock began engaging in a shouting match. Then, for whatever reason, the participants I had uh, instructed on Grey Rock also started engaging in the shouting match. Where have I seen that before? And then, <laughs> I once again used my body to defuse the situation, literally leaping across and over several women to grab the initial shouter on our side and kind of hug her and just said, no, no, no. <laughs> she immediately stopped, turned away from the situation, and we returned to our demonstration as planned. De escalation is key if you're going to go out. The vast majority of the engagement we received at that protest and at all the protests I've attended this year has been supportive. From gender clinics to women's prisons to women's sports, everywhere we've gone, what is the un what is undeniable is that as the average people are not okay with this agenda, and it's happening because average people are kept in the dark that it's even going on and to what extent. Yes. Never forget the vast majority of people alive, not just in this country, but around the world, agree with us on these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Always let that truth give you strength. I firmly believe that if you make a good plan, you can have safe turf protest just about anywhere in this country. Absolutely. Use your discretion. Use your best Thank judgment. You that, I, that's what I believe. That's yeah. what I believe. I can't overemphasize the planning part. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't just show up and wing it. No. There are plenty of great guides available to help anyone learn some good basic techniques for organizing a protest. Numbers will matter, experience will matter, the specific circumstances and geography will matter. But I say we use our right to free speech on this issue while we still have it. Yeah. As we learn from what they did to Thistle, they are so desperate to take even that away that they're not beyond leveraging non-existent laws to do so. Yeah. I attended a talk last month also New York City held by the Center for Bioethics and Culture. The talk was titled, How Gender Harms Women and Girls. The most disruptive thing that happened at this talk was that my phone went off and started playing electronic dance music <laughs> right at the start of Natasha Chart's remarks. My sincerest apologies to Natasha Chart and of course the organizer, Jennifer Law. Other than me being me at this talk, it went off as scheduled, without disruption, interruption, and without any danger. As we arrived at the hotel where the talk was held, so there were maybe a half a dozen uh, protesters outside. They were tamed. From what I remember, they were almost all women. Again, they're always women. They held signs that read, lesbians for trans women. <coughs> The signs might as well have read straight women or lesbians for men. <laughs> but I, I didn't have any signs of my own, but determined not to be out demonstrated, I started chanting, keep prison single sex, keep prison single sex, keep prison single sex. The worst thing I overheard one of them say was, you know, you're really sad. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> there definitely could not have been more than 10 of these women. This was the organized protest <laughs> to the event. 
10 women just like us in this room, except somewhere their logic around sexual orientation and sex-based rights had gone awry. They weren't belligerent or violent, just misguided. They were women with whom we might have engaged in conversation about the issue if we had arrived at the hotel early enough. Nobody touched us. Nobody got in our faces. There was no violence of any kind from anyone on either side. After the talk, there was a trans rights, a trans <laughs> supremacy active, supremacist activist that was especially obnoxious. It was a trans identified male, and he was jeering from across the street as we spilled out of the venue after the talk was over. He was young, appearing to be maybe in his early 20s. I assume the hotel staff had ushered him across the street, but I really don't know. <laughs> a few of the women went over and engaged. Snarky verbal jabs were exchanged for a good while, but that was it. Um, Karen Davis, you all know from YouTube, even posted footage of the interaction on her channel. Other women might have as well, I'm not sure. You can check it out for yourself. On a post on her YouTube channel, Karen Davis stated a few weeks after that, after that incident that she ended up sitting directly from that guy in summer. I assume maybe on public transportation, but I'm really not sure. She reports that she didn't say or do anything, and neither did she. There was peace. In addition to the two events in New York City I described above, I protested uh, from Washington, D.C. to Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington State within this past year. <laughs> Luckily, there's been no violence or what I consider genuinely intimidating harassment of uh, any of these seven, maybe more, church street demonstrations I've attended this year. They've been extremely annoying, but I've never felt physical fear. Um, I mentioned before the, that the vast majority of this response we get is supportive. Literally everyone is a turf. <laughs> if you get an opportunity to attend protests on this issue, consider it. If no one else is organizing a demonstration, consider taking it up yourself, especially if there are other turfs in your area and everyone is just waiting for something to come around so they can participate. Definitely do reach out to women that have at least attended other protests so you have some sense of what to consider and how to plan. I believe if we are too afraid to show our resistance publicly, we will make it look like there is no resistance. That's right. I applaud all the women looking for a way to join us that makes sense for them. I know there are many. If in life, physical protests are generally not doable for you, we still have the other option, which is um, the paper protest. I was asked to deliver a presentation at Women's Declaration International this past winter, and there I tried to advance the idea of paper protests. If you cannot find an actual physical protester, really, really simply don't want to, you can and should take up paper protests. Paper protests are simply the use of informational stickers, pamphlets, leaflets, and flyers. It is a lot of fun devising up little pieces of paper that explain about the harms and horrors of trans ideology, then more fun still to think of where you'll place them all and go out and actually do it. At the beginning of this talk, I told you that I would explain why you should listen to me, but I don't think I ever did. <laughs> what I hope I did manage to convey is that you should listen to you. You should tune into your values, your fears, your strengths, your weaknesses, your courage, and answer this call. I also told you at the beginning of this talk that I would use my courage to call on yours, and I hope that I have. Please come to this fight. Please bring your weak sauce first attempt. Please bring your really earth shattering idea or your super basic one. Please, please come tell us about how scared you were putting up your very first sticker. Please come tell us about how you ran out of ink on your printer, printing up five pamphlets, but you went out with what you had and you stuck those in a book somewhere for another woman to find. 
if you're lucky enough to meet up with other turfs and do an actual demonstration somewhere in public, definitely share that. Some of the women in this movement have paid a price we'll never have to. They were doing this work before the term turf even existed to drive us all together. They were doing it when it really, really was completely sad and lonely and isolated. They did it so the rest of us didn't have to, and for that, we owe them. and fight of our own. We will hold signs, we will draw pamphlets, we will chant, we will pick it, we will write letters, we will make phone calls. We will take pieces of sidewalk chalk and write a message on a piece of pavement that only one or two people will see before it gets washed out, but we will continue the work. Sometimes we'll consider whether our efforts are worth it, but they are. They always are. You were stronger after you did it than you were before. You were a better soldier in the struggle than you were before, and for that reason alone, it was worth it. Courage is a muscle. If you've never right. used it before, it will be weak. It will ache at first use. Over time, it will get stronger. Over time, you will get better. Over time, we'll all get better. We'll keep leveling up and picking more women and spreading a message until one day we will finally win. Your participation can make the difference now. We may yet herald the dawn of a new day. So please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.